I hope you had the opportunity to talk, meet new people, and interact. We are very pleased to start with our first panel, and it will be focusing and continuing the focus on empowering women through education. This is the first panel where we're going to try the in-person and hybrid. So all of our presentations are recorded previously, but we have the honor of having two of our speakers presented here in person. So we will run the presentations, all the presentations, and then they will be come online, come in person for the Q&A. Does that make sense? Okay, mm -hmm. hoping that Buddha will help us and the technology will work for us. Yeah. Thank you very much. And open the, it is open. It's open. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fadila. I am a PhD candidate at UCLA Department of Education and my name is Alexa Barger. I'm a PhD student in French at UCLA. Uh, so, uh, good uh, morning, everyone. Uh, the title of our presentation is Rereading Muslim Female Scholars in Times of Change, Reflections on Mernisi and Jabbar and Implications for Female Education and Empowerment in the Maghreb. Uh, now, um, so I'm going to start with an introduction to provide a little bit of background about the, the topic. So, um, uh, the emergence of global citizenship education as a new educational model uh, dates back to the Global Education First Initiative in 2012, in which the goal of fostering global citizenship was among the three uh, essential priorities. Uh, the two other aims were uh, to put every child in school and to improve the quality of learning. This objective was again tackled in goal for uh, seven uh, in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations in 2016. In this respect, the role of education was expanded and arithmetic skills to include the noble goals of peace, gender equity, mutual respect, environmental protection. The UNESCO plays an important role in canonizing the field of global citizenship education, and the importance of creating gender equity in educational spaces is actually reflected in its emphasis on in goal uh, four uh, on uh, quality of education and also goal five on gender equality. Okay, uh, interesting enough, according to sustainable development goals, target four, seven, as shown in the slide, uh, which says like by 2030, ensure that all learners acquire, acquire knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including among others through education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and non-violence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity and of cultures' contribution to sustainable development. Gender equality, as we see here, is juxtaposed with the goal of fostering global citizenship and promoting sustainable development. Both are key to achieving sustainable futures. Um, to set uh, the the background uh, now, how does sustainable development go target four seven plays out in or play out in the Maghreb context uh, in Algeria in particular, and why is the context relevant to this discussion? So here I quote the Algerian sociologist Marnia Lazarek uh, in her book The Eloquence of Silence: Algerian Women in Questions, when she states that nationalism is seen as the other side of the colonial coin. Therefore, to understand the experiences of Algerian women in the post-colonial uh, period and the way it impacts their educational opportunities, it is important to take a look at their experiences in the pre-colonial and pre-Islamic period. First of all, um, uh, the pre-Islamic Algeria witnessed the womanhood for one of the historical um, um, uh, things that we can mention about like uh, experience of women is the womanhood of Al Kahina who was uh, a Berber uh, queen who led her people against the Arab conquest of North Africa in the 7th century. She became a symbol of free women. 
During the pre-colonial era, women uh, used male European captives to help them to clean their homes, run errands and uh, care for animals and also do other dom domestic uh, stuff at home. And women didn't themselves before these captives and showed a great freedom when dealing with men in general. Moreover, there were variations from region to region about veiling and lifestyle. Uh, during the colonial period of Algeria, the imposed prostitution, especially in cities such as Busada, along with the French system, which is viewed as immoral and contradicts with Islamic values, created the phenomenon of veiling, which came to be used as a form of difference and resistance. During the decolonization period, um, Algerian National War, during the Algerian National War, uh, women actively participated in the War of Liberation. And here we can mention uh, Zohra Drif, Bouhiret, uh, Lilla Fatma Tsumar, Ben Bouhli, among other martyrs and freedom fighters. That being said, the political independence could be viewed as a disadvantage of, for the Algerian woman. And here, the revolutionary model of the state that used Arabization along with Islamization to change the social landscape of the country. So as a result, women are still treated uh, less than men. And uh, the stereotypical uh, depiction of women's lack of agency and disempowerment became a uh, common sense. Now, by situating the contemporary narrative on Maghrebi women within the broader global discourse on gender equality on the one hand and the post-colonial narrative on patriarchy as the norm, on the other hand, how can literary studies help us understand Maghreb women experiences and what are the implications of these literary studies for women's empowerment in the Maghreb? And in order to answer that question from Fadila, I want to provide the example of the writings in the life of Asya Jabbar, who was born Fatima Zahra Imalayan in 1936. And so she was born in Shashel to a middle-class family of Chinois Amazigh background. Her father was an educator and worked in the French colonial system where she began her education. From ages five to 10, she was also enrolled in the Quranic school. Um, but then was not able to continue those studies uh, due to separation of boys and girls and completed her secondary education partly in French schools in Algeria and then in metropolitan, what we call metropolitan France. She would also do her higher education there. And this would be around the time of the War of Independence. So when she returns in 1962 to Algeria, she attempts to begin her career as an educator of history and literature but finds that um, Arabic has been instituted as the only language of education, which is very troubling because what we see in her writings and in her decision to work in France from that point forward is that language and gender are interconnected in her narrative of education. To that end, I think we can especially look at works like uh, L'Amour, La Fantasia, or Fantasia, as we call it in English, because it is one designed to be kind of a comparative narrative of Algerian women's experiences from the colonial period to Asya Jabbar's present day in the 1980s, but it begins with her childhood and the moment in which she was brought to the French colonial school. And I'll read this quote that describes her experience. From the very first day that a little girl leaves her home to learn the ABCs, the neighbors adopt that knowing look of those who in 10 or 15 years time will be able to say, I told you so, while commiserating with a foolhardy father, for misfortune will inevitably befall them. And what we see here is this sense of scrutiny, of exclusion that Jabach experiences, and also these contradictions of edu being educated in a colonial system, that one allows her a certain freedom in how she can dress and how she can move through certain spaces, but also doesn't allow her a greater connection with her faith and with her certain aspects of her culture. And so it's interesting when we compare this com this narrative with um, how she describes the Quranic school, and she, I quote directly, it's paradise regained for her because she's able to refamiliarize with herself with calligraphy, with her faith, with aspects also of um, her mother's side of the story. But slowly, she begins this education with a few girls, and then slowly she becomes the only girl. She was with other girls also of Amazigh background, then becoming the only girl, then eventually being excluded as a result of her gender. 
And so when she looks back at all this, she describes this kind of ambivalence and this kind of exilic relationship to language. And I read the quote, the language of the others in which I was enveloped from childhood, the gift my father loving, lovingly bestowed upon me, that language has adhered to me ever since. And that sense of adhering is kind of poisonous and painful, but at the same time, it's something that allows her a great amount of mobility in terms of her education. And this, I think, becomes quite clear when we look at the context provided by Las Vegas and also by Fatima Mernissi when describing women's education. Whereas young girls, maybe in the 19th century of Jabbar's background, would not have been able to hope for a transformation of their lives through education, they would have these moments later. And there's almost this kind of radical promise in having these combinations of experiences. And I'll read this quote from Las Vegas that women who were born in the 1930s and many of these women who were also involved in the War of Independence were the first generation who had attended French schools or Franco-Arab schools. And Algerian children who had happened to attend these kinds of schools were able to attend these and attain higher levels of education in the French system. So at the same time that they have this opportunity and are able to imagine different, a different future for their nation, they soon become excluded. And by the time Fatima Mernissi is writing about Islam and democracy at the time of the civil war in the 90s, they become targeted. And Mernissi just claims that the reason that these women continue to be targeted is simple. They are the only ones who publicly assert their right to self-affirmation as individuals, not just through words, but through actions, having succeeded in infiltrating one of the citadels, which was long forbidden to women, formal education. So I think there's a certain level of resistance that women demonstrate by seeking this education. But I think when we look at Jabbar, we also see how language and culture complicate this and make that sense of targeting even more acute. So this becomes more evident when we look at Algerian white or Le Blanc de l'Algerie, which is mainly focused on um, violence during the Civil War and Jabbar continuing to reflect on the post-colonial state. And she really condemns the educational system in its, prom quote, promoting the national language of Arabic by officially restricting the living space of the other languages. So she's talking about different dialects of Tanazir. She's talking about um, spoken forms of Arabic. And she's also looking at how French is being increasingly diminished, banishing a dialect that was vivid in its original iridescence and creating the denial of an entire people's genius thereby connecting these matters of gender, language, and culture in the negation of the possibility for global citizenship and growth. So to counteract this, and Jabbar is also kind of looking at this with a sense of complicity in having had opportunities that might not have been available to many girls, and also looking at kind of her cohort of fellow writers, she says there needs to be another way of looking at this. And I'll read the quote here, that perhaps it is time for the few writers, and I would also say, educators occupied with questions of Algerianité to tackle texts that they may feel constrained to write, no longer memory of a colonial past in which their childhood took place, and she's kind of holding herself accountable here, but in the light of present threats on the land of their ancestors, even if they have left it behind. So in that sense, she's she's proposing this image of a literary and also kind of a philosophical Algerianité as a counter action to the state imposed mode of education that excludes individuals on the basis of culture, on linguistic basis, on questions of gender, such that we can continue to kind of foster these newer possibilities, ones that don't negate a people's genius, as she describes. So I think when we look at the GCEs that Fadila described, we also have to recognize that attending quality education and gender equality requires a level of cultural and historical awareness that depends on the nation and the setting. But for Jabach, this is something that is impacted by many different factors, a colonial history, a multilingual family, experiences of artistic and intellectual exile, and I think when we look at her testimonies and we look at a broader body of literature, we can see how this, this kind of writing can be an assessment and a testimony of experiences of education. And I would also argue that educators need to continue to consider these accounts when engaging with these ideas of global 
um, education and global citizenship, because it's only by looking at this that it can be made possible. So I want to thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Joel Pierce, and I'm based at the University of Aberdeen. And my name is Dua Bayoumi, and I'm actually I'm Egyptian, I was based now in England, and uh, done my PhD. Just to give you a bit about myself, um, I got my bachelor's from other university back in Cairo, and then I moved to the States for a number of years when I did my master's at the University of Chicago in Islamic Studies. And then I finally, I landed in England, um, and I've done my PhD at the University of Birmingham. Whereas I've done all my all my degrees at the University of Aberdeen. <laughs> so uh, we did we're presenting today on online scriptural reasoning as a pedagogical tool for empowering women uh, case study. And this is going to be based on um, a project that we did together. Um, Doa and I met through an interfaith fellowship program and we'd known each other for a couple of years before we did this project um, through that program i became aware of scriptural reasoning as a practice and i worked on it at a kind of local level but i'd never tried it online uh, prior to the pandemic but Doa has a lot deeper background in scriptural reasoning so she'll talk about that a bit now um so yeah so my like i, I was first actually introduced to a scripture reasoning i was um like 2014, when I was um, invited by Cambridge Summer School to have uh, two weeks, two extensive weeks on scripture reasoning. And I met with people from all over the world and we were actually introduced to different texts. And this is how I felt I just, I need to do this more with in a different context. And then it was um, during the pandemic time, um, I felt we needed perhaps more alternative because most of the worshiping places were shut down. And uh, with with the help of other two colleagues, we started this online platform where we invited religious community students. It was a variety of like number of different people who come for this online platform. And we have done uh, working on text that really talks about how people can encounter such kind of difficulties and how our scripture is telling us about these kind of things. Uh, so we just took it from there. And me and Joel, we sat together and we decided perhaps we need to do something um, you know, for educational level, and then being coming from as an university, I'm aware that there is a um, huge number of students who are studying religion in theory, but they hardly encounter with someone from outside their tradition. So we felt there is a need for those students to have this kind of online platform, and instead of like traveling and you know having all these kind of like funding to be able to travel uh, somewhere, we offer them this kind of opportunity. It's kind of like a structured one uh, for, 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 for two years. So they can ju just have the chance of meeting with someone uh, from the UK universities and exchange ideas. Great. So this paper is going to be based on some of the data we gathered from that in terms of how the program affected um, those who participated in it. And since a lot of those who participated, particularly on the Egyptian side, were women, we're going to focus on their experiences. So just to give you uh, a picture in your mind's eye or uh, on the screen, this is what one of our sessions looked like. Um, and this was an early session. Um, so you'll see there's a lot of cameras off. We'll talk about why that's the case a little later on. But we'd have up, you know, between 15, 20 people, here's 16 that are participating now. So the questions we're going to look at are, what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing uh, interfaith dialogue in this kind of informal way um, for women in the Middle East and in Egypt in particular? And what, and does scriptural reasoning itself um, offer some opportunities for the empowerment of Egyptian women? So just uh, so for some definitions and background information, uh, scriptural reasoning is a particular kind of interfaith dialogue. The way it works is that you get a text uh, from the scripture of each tradition that's participating, and someone will introduce that text, and then uh, people will have the opportunity to make observations about it or ask questions. And so this is a way for um, people from one religious tradition to host people in their their text and for people to be guests in another person's uh, or another faith's text. Um, and it goes both ways. Um, and so it's a really great way of identifying commonality and difference and building friendship across uh, religious traditions. 
Um, uh, we use, uh, yeah, Doha? Yeah, so I was going to say, like, most of the women who participate in this program, they are mainly from Egypt and uh, they're coming from Sharia law. Um, they, their English is okay. Um, we just had a kind of like um, application at the beginning just to make sure that they are able to, um, you know, kind of like dialogue with their colleagues from the uh, from the British universities here. Um, as you can see, I like male uh, students who received some instruction in English in, in, with an other university. Those women, they were actually taught in, in only in Arabic. And that's why we thought that it's going to be a good chance for them to have this kind of like different experience. Uh, they cannot travel abroad because they financially they, there is no scholarships offered for them to travel abroad and have this kind of opportunities. And also, um, when it comes to the university curriculum itself, it lacks the multi-perspective approach. Most of the uh, topics they are taught within the Islamic perspective, so they barely know anything about how Christianity, for example, was actually is like you know just taught within Christian perspective. How Judaism is taught within um, Jews' perspective. All these kind of things are they are not aware of, and also uh, their opportunities to interact with someone who's native speaker. Of course, this is actually going to enhance their ability to uh, have a sort of like conversation skills and dialogue skills as well. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. So those are that's all knowledge that Doha had just from going through the al -Azhar program, but that's also stuff that shows up in the literature. For example, Yosef Mary um, di uh, documents a lot of these uh, barriers to interfaith dialogue in uh, the Middle East. Yeah, Courtney is actually um, one of my colleagues and we have been working together on exchange programs um, in, in Cairo as well. Um, when he, she, in, in this article, because we um, she wrote a book and actually we co-author one, one chapter together. So she was talking about the virtual exchange and how it really provides a kind of like very unique and significant opportunity for international students, especially those who are, uh, they, they, they have limited sources to be able to travel abroad. And when we have explored this kind of things, when we have done the, our virtual exchange together. Uh, and also for this one, it talks a bit about the um, the government restriction, the current government restriction, the Egyptian government, and how they leans towards supporting conservative perspective. And this actually offers kind of like um, limitation for interfaith dialogue. And this is explains a bit why we decided to go for the online platform so we could ease all these kind of like um, security check and you know kind of like government limitation on interfaith dialogue of course we have a trusted uh, institution such as the british council who um generously offered to have um uh, the the part of the selection for students they were taking part in this uh, process so most of the students who are coming from other university they to some extent also study with the british council and to have the program in english and, and that's how we can um we have tried to make sure that their english is okay so they can have a good conversation with their colleagues here in in, in england yeah so as though was saying um they we recruited uh the Egyptian students mainly through the British Council. Um, the UK students we recruited through divinity and religious studies programs. Um, and once we'd gotten kind of a critical mass that we knew that we could do this, um, we moved on to uh, having SR sessions. And so the SR sessions met once a month. We had two groups uh, that met on different days during the week, but uh, once a month for seven months. So we got seven sessions in face-to-face uh, -face. and then also we had a whatsapp group that ran in the background where people could dialogue um, about the topics that came up in the discussion um, and then the final kind of phase of the project was gathering feedback um, and so on completing the sessions we had them uh, fill out a kind of more extensive questionnaire which i'm going to talk about a little later um, and this is some of our advertising material for uk students um, so when it comes to the program design itself, so uh, of course, um, when we first uh, launched this uh, initiative, we got a, lot, a huge number of students who were interested, especially from the Egyptian side, so we we're interested to come to this program. But then we have to make sure that it's really we have a balanced number from both sides. So we limited this into two groups and around like 20 students roughly, um, the majority were uh, women. 
Uh, so about like 12 female Egyptian students and uh, they were really committed to this program. Uh, and also we, um, because uh, we understand that students who are coming from different faith traditions, um, to some extent, they might also confuse some share uh, term terminologies uh, such as um, scripture, prophets, uh, God, and all these kind of things. So we try to make sure we have introductory session so we can introduce both the Quran and the Bible, emphasizing the history and the canonization, and all these kind of different backgrounds. So students, when they aim to have the first session, they have a solid background to stand on. Um, in terms of like the uh, like um, themes itself, of course, so we needed to make this short, uh, begin with something that really light and uh, um, substantial overlap, has substantial overlap so students can still can relate to each other. And then um, gradually, uh, session by session, we move to more uh, kind of like challenging um, topics and uh, which has a lot of uh, like difficulties and perhaps challenge, challenging questions. But we always make sure that we have those towards the end of the program. So this kind of like friendship and uh, trust has been already built so students can feel more comfortable to discuss all these kind of, uh, of issues. We also try to make sure within the design of the program to just give opportunities for leadership. So um, within the program itself, um, students can still have chance to lead some of the session, introduce the text, um, share their ideas. And of course, um, sometimes we just divide them into like smaller group and students can share more thoughts about uh, different things. Great. And just to drill down a bit more into like how the application and the feedback uh, worked, the application, I mean, some of it was just trying to make sure that we could get in touch with the people. Um, but we also were asking them about their past experiences with SR, other forms of interfaith dialogue, and also kind of attitudinal questions about, you know, how they viewed other faiths or even what their knowledge of other faiths was. Um, the feedback survey was a bit more extensive. We had uh, specific themes that we asked them about, so the overall experience of the program, but also attitudes towards the scriptures, their own and others, had they changed over the course of the program, um, friendships, uh, use of technology. So one of the things we were curious about was whether this works as a te technological experience, um, and also for the Egyptian students, whether the English language program um, that they're part of pre uh, prepared them for this for this program. Um, the questions were a mix of different kinds of uh, survey questions, everything from a kind of yes, no, maybe format to rate ranking things to short answer. So the findings we found in terms of our first questions were the advantages and disadvantages of online SR. Um, so one of the interesting things we discovered uh, was that the kind of gradations that you can participate in a Zoom meeting, everything from just listening in to kind of talking with your camera off to having your camera on and talking and being fully involved, um, actually kind of served our participants well in that it allowed them a very gentle entryway. So some some of the initial uh, participant or initially some of the participants only kind of listened in and were nervous about speaking. Maybe they thought their English language wasn't up to it or they didn't know how to have this kind of conversation, but they kept coming along and as they continued to come along, um, they got more confident and uh, more and more participated in the program. Um, and we did find that actually this, just the mere fact that you could have conversations online between people in Egypt and the UK was meant that this was one of the first opportunities for a lot of our participants to have interfaith conversations at all um, with someone from another faith or country. Um, and we found in terms of the feedback we got that it SR accomplished its goal, which was to kind of help them to see uh, commonalities between the two faiths and also um, to recognize the differences and still maintain friendships across those. Um, there are disadvantages to this sort of format, and I think we all know them who have used Zoom meetings, which is that Zoom is only as good as your internet connection. And for a lot of our uh, participants, internet connections were things that you know, went on and off in terms of how good they could be. Um, so sometimes we had participants who couldn't turn their camera on because the internet was just too slow or that it would drop them from the call and they'd have to rejoin and, you know, they struggled with that. And just sometimes I think also there's, uh, it seemed like from our feedback, there's can be a mismatch in terms of cultural perceptions of technology and what kind of relationships it can form. I think our Egyptian students seem to feel much closer to the UK students at the end. And the UK students, I think, did 
really appreciate the experience, but we're kind of skeptical that you could form friendships through the internet. And so um, maybe we're, we're less positive on like, oh, we're going to continue having these relationships going forward. Um, so those are like kind of like um, a feedback from students. And uh, of course, um, there's uh, other ones um, because part of the program we have done um, a Facebook page. And actually on the Facebook page, uh, there is a number of recordings by women from Egypt. And most of them, they were really happy to do this recording because they felt that the program affected them in a very positive way. But I'm just gonna read a bit of like the participant, how the participant described the program here. So um, some people found it really helpful, qualifies me to know about Christianity and Christians and, and not to be shocked or afraid of such experience in real life. And as Joel just mentioned now, because some of them, that was really the first experience ever to have someone from outside their tradition. Um, the other one, what I really like about this program, and there is no pressure and just sharing our thoughts because some of them, they would, you can see they come and go with a fear of um, maybe conversion and they have to make sure that they really speaks good about their own religion. But we try to make sure that they understand how the platform works in terms of like just sharing ideas and there was no pressure at all for, from saying anything. Um, also, the program equipped me with the valuable tools that have enhanced my understanding of my own religion. And this is also uh, what we found is um, just trying um, for each um, side to listen to the question uh, each student is actually raising. We, uh, they found it quite um, helpful for them also to have this kind of like um, question within their own traditions. Um, and um, one of the actually candidates I just want to share here, um, um, she continued also to have um, to participate in that. So the once it, she finished the program with us, she was really um, satisfied and happy about the whole experience, and she was encouraged to do more of this. So she applied for different programs, and she got a fellowship. And also uh, right now, she's happy to continue doing her ma masters in England, which is really a great progress for her because before this experience. Of so it was hard for her to know more about the Western approach to meet with someone from outside Egypt, but this one, one platform enabled her to have this kind of uh, nice experience. Yeah, and uh, in addition to people coming to England, uh, I got to go to Cairo and hang out with uh, and some of our um, participants in the SR program, and we actually did a little uh, SR in the British Council building in Cairo as kind of a bonus for some of our students based there. Um, so thank you so much for listening to our presentation and we look forward to uh, discussing it with you in the Q&A. Thank you. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويستغ لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Today, I'm glad to introduce my presentation about exploring Islamic education for women in the modern era, from indoctrination to digitalization. So, for the introduction, uh, actually, in the contemporary era, the utilization of technology plays a pivotal role in the uh, dissemination of Islamic knowledge, serving as a means to uh, rejuvenate and replicate information and this concept uh, of reproducing knowledge in the science of dawa uh, refers to the process of uh, generation generating of generating uh, contemporary information rooted in scientific principles without serving ties with traditional thought religious beliefs and cultural legacy and in the realm of um, in the realm of inviting individuals to embrace the worship of God, so the concept referred to here is a contemporary mindset uh, as understood by individuals from Western societies and those who align with uh, modern modernist perspectives. However, the focus lies on uh, the generation of novel religious insights. Uh, that cater to the specific Islamic social and cultural, educational and religious requirements of individuals. So this approach aims to assist each person in making 
uh, appropriate uh, choices that align with their personal uh, circumstances. So the study, uh, this study uh, investigates the, the significance and ch challenges and developments of Islamic education for women in the modern period. This research looks into the, the changing view of view, uh, viewpoints on women's education within Islamic principles, as well as the efforts made to promote women's education within Islamic principles, as well as the efforts made to promote women women's access to education in modern Muslim societies. Therefore, I take the a case study for the research. Uh, the case study of one of the new institutions in Egypt, which is called the uh, Ilm and Amal Institute, institutions, uh, al -ilmi wal -amal. So for research questions, uh, I focus on, uh, on two uh, research questions. Firstly, uh, to what extent or to what degree do online platforms and technologies influence the uh, caliper and in inclusiveness of um, in inclusiveness of Islamic education for women in contemporary times, and secondly, how do women's uh, how do women's perspectives and voices contribute to shaping the future of Islamic education, and what what role does digitalization play in amplifying their influence? So for a teacher review, actually Islamic education reform uh, across the Muslim world inhibits uh, a shared uh, characteristic, namely uh, the loss of uh, its former uh, magnif mag magnificence and uh, splend splendor. Um, and this, these reforms uh, are currently grappling with, with the challenges Posed by um, globally uh, com competitive environment, while also occupying a pre preferential uh, position within within robust formal education system. So, as Lewin, Lewin uh, stated, that the idea of uh, indoctrination, which is defined as uh, persuading someone or else to believe something, seems impractical. Impractical, which is one of the uh, one of its main issues. Like Islam has always placed a high value on knowledge transfer, but but the institution that facilitate this trans transmission have evolved over time. Have uh, have been evolved over time, as Hafner said. So there is uh, uh, numerous or many publications on Islamic education and Islamic schooling provide valuable insights into the teachings of Islam, but their approach often lacks systematic deeps and conceptual deeps, uh, and this hindering a comprehensive understanding of Islamic education and Islamic teaching. So there is, there is a little empirical study on how internet platforms help women access uh, uh, varied and progressive Islamic education. So this uh, research or this exciting research will be focusing on this existing research will be focusing on uh, traditional methods and their uh, uh, indo indoctrination of potential uh, overlooking new media. So therefore, therefore, um, this study examine how digitalization empowers women and in Islamic education um, and this topic a to uh, topic um, has gotten little attention in the literature in general so for methodology the study the study is the case study uh, method to investigate the emergence of Islamic institutions in Egypt, in Egypt and Middle East and it specifically examined institutions such as the institution of Ilm and Amal along with various online Islamic courses that have uh, uh, um, have gained considerable uh, popularity among mis Muslim youth, so particularly females. So this the, the primary phase of data collecting encompassed conducting interviews with female students 
uh, affiliated with uh, with the um, over mentioned uh, institution and um as as um uh, subsequent research uh, endeavors will be uh, dedicated to further uh, uh, augmenting uh, the existing the existing uh, data set. So the process of data analysis involves the utilization of both qualitative and qualitative analysis and comparative analysis techniques. So for findings. Um, the research indicates that the process of the of digitalization has had a substantial impact on expanding the availability of Islamic education for women. This has resulted in the removal of long-standing obstacles and has facilitated greater participation of women in religious studies or Islamic studies. So one of the inter interviews, inter one of the interviewees said that she learned that a lot of the act, a lot of the acts oh, that we perform in worship are heresy or bid'ah. so uh, yet the islamic uh, curricula or curriculum in uh in an amal institute have uh, taught her how to an identify this heresy along with the methods for for studying hadith Additionally, how to worship in the proper way. In fact, I was. Uh, she said that I was able to com uh, comprehend a lot of uh, theology or aqidah that I had previously been unable to understand because of my Islamic or her previous Islamic tradition. So overall. Uh, due to the in incorporation of modern moth methods and digital tools, the positive impact of contemporary Islamic education on women provides them with a more sophisticated view of their faith. Finally, as conclusions, um, in summary, uh, reforming Islamic education for women is both essential and a chance to empower a new wave of female scholars and uh, instru uh, instructors. So we can uh, guarantee that Islamic education continues to be a lighthouse, a lighthouse of knowledge, uh, alignment and empowerment for women in the contemporary era by pressing the changing dynamics of education in the Islamic education in the digital, digital age. So uh, this study has shown that there are a lot of unanswered questions and areas that might be explored further. Uh, subsequent research or to explore the com the complex obstacles that Islamic education for women faces and look for creative fixes that make make use of um, digital uh, technologies and Furthermore, there there is the, there is much to be learned about the changing institutions, various in, institutions that support knowledge transfer stressed in Islamic way in the context of women, women's education in the Muslim world. But that's all for now. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you so much. I've got all our presenters and the co-presenters that virtually with us. If you are with us and you are a co-presenter or a presenter who is not present, can you please um, open right to that? They open their video and their audio. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to start with the question and we have a few others. We only have about 20 minutes for this, so I apologize if we cannot take all the questions, but that's why we have our wonderful presenters here. Some of them are here in person. So I would like to start with a question on uh, Fatma Marnisi. I, I grew up reading Fatma Marnisi and, uh, and believing it's what her work was telling us as women. Um, of course, I'm uh, now uh, too old for uh, for that type of uh, <laughs> activism, but I'm hoping the new generation don't believe that too old thing. It's just a cliche, but the new generation is um, as fierce as important, you know, and fierce in terms of pursuing 
women and the women issues and the interpretations of how to perceive women, whether it's in Islam or culture and tradition and so forth. My question is to the presenter here. Uh, I think we have uh, Ms. Fadila with us. Fadila. Fadila, sorry. Yeah, the question is, because you've done this research and looked very in depth about what her life was about as a, a Muslim woman and Arab woman in Algeria, <clears throat> why is it that we don't have many new my nieces, my woman nieces. What do you think are the reasons behind not having many of her <laughs> in Arab uh, world, Arab society, Arab culture? And we'll let you answer the question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ilham, for uh, your question. Uh, actually, this is part of my colleague, Alexa, who is absent today. Uh, so uh, I focus more on the first part because I'm working more on the field of global citizenship education. How can we promote that in um, North Africa and the Maghreb region? Um, so why there are not more like Mernisi and Asya Jabbar in today's Arab world um, is a very good question. Um, I think it's just like, um, you know, like what happened after the uh, post-independence and nationalism and everything, like there is like... Um, kind of conservatism, um, which is like the outcome of like the colonial experience. And uh, we know that um, the experiences of like, especially those people who had like uh, French um, education, like Asia Jubar and uh, get to be a scene, like their education was like more in French. Um, so after the independence, like we had like Arabization, so they kind of experienced kind of alienation um, and like they were obliged like to exile, uh, et cetera. So I would say it's like more about like nationalism, but um, I think today with um, with uh, the expansion of English as a global um, as a global language, there is like more empowerment because uh, the resistance like towards French, uh, especially uh, I'm talking about the Algerian context, um, is now like um, more, uh, when it comes to English, like there is kind of more convivia conviviality and people now started like looking having like other perspectives that are different from theirs. And uh, we are hopeful that in the future we'll have more uh, like Asia Jabbar and Marisi. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiola. I now remember uh, you were there with us in person at American University last year. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any questions from the audience here? We'll take you and then back to the online. Any questions for any of the speakers? Um, and please just raise your hand if you have one, but let me ask the second question. So one of the comments online was regarding Ferreri's and his work, and Paulo Ferreri is a Brazilian educator who has, who has worked on uh, um, uh, education of the oppressed and how do you get to education transformation? I'm sure many of you, and it's not just education, but transforming society, transforming the power asymmetry between the oppressor and the oppressed and this type of work. Uh, one of the comments online was regarding the dialogue and how Sareri used dialogue to change the balance between the oppressed and the oppressor. And of course, it's a uh, little more complex than what we think dialogue is, because dialogue, according to Freddy, is not just the talking, and just the, you know, but there should be some symmetry and maybe changing the symmetry between the parties who are speaking. So, this is the comment online, and my follow up question to our, both of our speakers is uh, regarding this dialogue. One, you know, one is about women and their. Uh, interpretation and then, you know, uh, in Islamic education, but the other one is about the interfaith dialogue. Do you notice that there are, did you notice uh, that there are some asymmetries in your dialogue, interfaith dialogue with the British Christian um, group, even though it's online, there is a hegemony of English, for example, as the method and the way of talking and, and dialogue, dialogue jigging, is that a verb? Theology. And um, my second question to you is 
the external Christian Muslim dialogue versus the internal Christian Muslim dialogue in Egypt. Why that and not the internal one? And then I will ask you a question. Maybe you can give us some comments regarding the use of dialogue. And you mentioned English, and you mentioned you know uh, language, and you mentioned uh, so. Please, if you can relate to that. Right. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to such a um, great uh, conference. Um, uh, Joel, please, hi first. Uh, please help me if you want to answer any of the questions because I'm not here uh, myself. Uh, but I would love to start with the one on um, the insider and outsider because this is part of the uh, interfaith dialogue. Um, of course, the conversation was quite different. Um, some of the uh, other university students, we already have this kind of like um, uh, work with some uh, Coptic Christian in Egypt. Um, and of course, the culture is, is quite important because um, they would speak in Arabic, so they would feel more confident speaking to them in Arabic. But uh, so I would imagine that um, the question they are reading is quite different from someone from outside Egypt. And this was uh, partially in, in intentional. So, um, because again, um, students who are studying at other university, uh, part of the assumption is basically Christianity as a whole is just one group. Uh, and and within within the program we have designed is basically we just try to let them understand how Christianity as a religion is a huge religion. When it's actually coming to be participated, there's the cultural element, which is very important. There is different, you know, kinds of groups, like uh, Protestant, Catholic, and Coptic. So it's not just one group. It's a very, very diverse. And even within the UK universities, uh, some of the students, they would assume they're coming from a Christian family, but they are quite secular in a way that it's really hard to claim that they are really like, you know, Christian participants and they just go to the church every single day. So this was intentionally part of our program so students can be aware of like, the diversity within one religion. Um, and of course, the same would apply to Islam because um, many of the students who are coming to the program, they would assume Islam as a just one single, you know, fun practice. But when they uh, come and they start to learn more about how Muslims living in Egypt, um, you know, just sort of like active religion, they know that there is other Muslims who would really have different kinds of like, you know, practices because again, culture is very important and Islam as a religion is very kind of like very um, open to, you know, adapt to different cultures. Uh, so this is I have the first question. The second one you said, um, can you remind me because it's just like uh, yeah, I guess I can try. <laughs> I mean, I guess just what I was thinking about in response to the question about power asymmetries, particularly, um, there certainly is, you know, because we are doing the dialogue in English, there is that asymmetry and that um, is just a feature of a, a program that's set up between English uh, students and Egyptian students, just because English students are, for the most part, monolingual. Um, but uh, I will say that I think scriptural reasoning is actually a really nice tool in terms of kind of deflating some of those asymmetries, because uh, the students who are coming from Egypt were, were acting as experts um, in the text and the, their interpretations of the text. And so um, that dynamic of acknowledging that you're being a get the English students were a guest in the Quranic text, and equally um, the Muslim students were a guest in the biblical text, um, sets them up in kind of a reciprocal relationship of hosting and guesting, um, which does a little bit deflate uh, some of those power dynamics. Um, so, yeah, I, that's one thing I like about scriptural reasoning. Thank you. And uh... Do you want to say something about dialogue? Do you have any room in your project, in your study? Okay. Okay. Thank you uh, so much for your question. And uh, you have mentioned the words of uh, and uh, it's interesting to hear about it. Uh, actually, uh, I, I haven't read uh, any of the uh, books, but uh, I I thank you for your recommendations. I will agree with it. Um and uh, for for the interventions, um, you know, uh, 
I assure the gifts for me of uh, this institution, Mahadran and Raman, because I, I found it interesting because, you know, in Egypt, uh, you cannot get uh, uh, formal Islamic education unless you are studying in Al Azhar. So I, I found this institution, it's uh, it's not formal institution, but uh, uh, the, uh, the institution gives the opportunity uh, to to the people who are not uh, uh, to to learn about Islamic education through this uh, institution, especially for uh, for women. And um, we were speaking also about uh, uh, the the reality, and they have these sustainability uh, aims because um um after after getting the courses in this uh, institution, you can teach. Also, after uh, after graduating from from the uh, uh, the courses as a uh, uh, you can teach uh, whether you can teach children or uh, also young women. Mm -hmm. Thank you. She had her hand raised. Madila, are you still wanting to add? Just raise your hand. You know, use that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to congratulate uh, Joel, Joel and uh, uh, Dra, a great project. And I have shared in the comment, it's like uh, doing global citizenship in action. And uh, we need like a lot of interfaith dialogue. And uh, yeah, you really like uh, use a lot of uh, queries, concept like dialogue and trust, etc. So I just like, I'm just like curious about like the, the project itself. Um, in terms of um, the concept of like empowerment itself, like how did you in, how did you define empowerment? Um, is it in, like uh, because I wouldn't like really follow it very well? Is it empowerment of uh, which which context uh, uh, is the empowerment term re refers to? And also, did you like use any specific criteria in terms of like selection of participants, maybe uh, background about religion? Like, um, I don't know, like what, what background like did they have? Because, uh, um, yeah, especially in both like religions, like there are a lot of resources. So um, what criteria did you use in order to uh, select the participants in terms of religious knowledge? age, uh, et cetera, and also proficiency in terms of uh, English language. And um, since I am a linguist, um, I, I always like, um, um, I'm cautious about the, uh, the concept of language, uh, the, the issue of language barrier. Um, in Egypt, English is the second language. They are way more better than us because English is our fourth language in the Maghreb. Um, but did you use like what are like ways that you use in order to prevent like dominance in terms of like, dominance of the conversation, especially uh, people from Christian background, they are monolinguals in English. Uh, let's say, for instance, Egyptians, they want like to express themselves, but they don't have the expression in English. So it's more in Arabic, especially like Quran, like rich resource. So how, do, how did they... Uh, how they how did they express okay. themselves and whether like there is translation or um, yeah thank you yes we get it thank you thank you get the question okay thank you microphone so I was wondering would you like yes. yeah yeah I I can take a step well if and maybe you can add um, if the microphone's working um yeah I think that those are great questions um so empowerment um. I think what we were looking for uh, in terms of empowerment are do the women who participated feel um, more confident both in participating in these kinds of dialogues, but also in terms of their knowledge of other faiths um, and the ability to uh, participate in interfaith dialogue, either in a local setting or further down the road. Um, and also in terms of um, getting access to education um, and opportunities that otherwise wouldn't be available. Um, Though Doha can add because I mean this is really she knows what the local setting is a lot better than me. <laughs> but I, in terms of managing the conversation, um, that certainly is a challenge, and actually that's a challenge um, in any form of uh, scriptural uh, reasoning. Um, even here in the UK, where everyone's first language is English, but part of the way we did that actually was having Doha and I kind of trade off in terms of um, facilitating. Um, and, and also emphasizing 
the asking of questions rather than um, people speaking for a long time. So you know, when when we do the presentation of the text, you know, uh, or someone, oh, sorry, actually, now that I think about it, another way we did this is we would invite participants um, to have uh, for each text, um, someone would introduce it. So there would be an Egyptian student um, who would introduce the Quranic text and give a background on its meaning. Um, and then when the Christian students came in, it would be to ask a question or something, and then the Egyptian student could maybe explain a bit more um, what's going on. Um, and so there was there was a there was a fairly um, structured way of doing things. And Doa and I were intervening to make sure that everyone got a chance to speak a fair amount. So we managed the conversation. I think if there was, I think there was something else that you'd asked, uh, <laughs> but it's gone out of my brain. Um, duh, did you want to add in? Yeah, sure. So uh, I just want to uh, come back to, uh, for people who are not familiar with the um, Laza University as a platform, it's actually, there is a segregation between women and male. So uh, I come from Azan University, I got my bachelor's from Azan University, and I was the, the whole department was basically uh, women. Um, so, and uh, because the education is for free, so you can imagine uh, people who um, would be interested in this kind of like a platform. So uh, usually you got people from the suburb, from the you know, countryside, and they are really willing to learn more because they are going to go back to where they are from. And well, the easiest thing is just to be a teacher. So we thought training a teacher was just going to go back and teach uh, other, you know, kind of like um, women from the village. And this perhaps would be the only chance for them to have this kind of education. The other thing is uh, most of the scholarship, they just go straight away to uh, male departments because they would, there's assumption that those male could still travel abroad and they have this kind of like, you know, they master different languages. So I felt there is a need, being Egyptian myself, I felt there is a need to bridge this gap between East and the West and offering them uh, this kind of opportunity without having any kind of like fear or concern from their families, because again, for them to travel abroad is kind of like a really a big issue. So having this online platform was kind of like a way to, you know, kind of like just bridge this gap and offer them extra because most of them they come in from religious um they study at religious studies uh, in the department so i assume they would be like kind of like an islamic teacher so it's just offering them extra kind of like curriculum to enable them to learn more about the other perspective and you know so this was uh basically the the whole thing thank you and Nora. yeah help us thank you Thank you so much. That's a really interesting presentation. So it's a question I hope that would have, I think, be relevant to all three papers. But I think it was in your paper presentation, Dua and Joel, that this idea of a host and a guest came up. And I've been involved in interreligious dialogue works across the three Abrahamic faiths for a while now. And I think we make assumptions about insider status. And, and that came up as well. We assume that because somebody identifies as Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, that the person actually has an understanding of what it means to be Muslim, Christian, or Jewish. Um, and, and then we draw a line between the insider and the guest, to use your term. And I find it often when I speak to certain students or young people or older people that they themselves are a guest in their own faith. And I'm wondering whether you could speak to that. You know, is this assumption that because I ascribe to a particular identity, I therefore have an understanding? Is that a true assumption? Or do you find that people ascribe to an identity, but actually they don't have a full understanding? And could that be a contributing factor as to why there is a reluctance to engage in interfaith dialogues? Thanks. Uh, so basically, again, the idea of like insider outsider is quite fascinating, and thank you so much for bringing this into the conversation. I think what I like, what we liked about SR scripture reasoning is basically, um, I'm sure on, on our own as a Muslim, we have done a lot of SR to, like to own our tradition. So, um, like a group of people would just need to read the Quran and they understand it, but that 
the, I mean, like the question, we are raised is quite different. So when outsiders come into the conversation, they are bringing a new out like platform. So basically, when they start to raise questions, it's, it's quite different. Um, but I think to some extent, I think I agree with you with this idea of like, uh, although we are, uh, we assume we are kind of like, um, um, you know, like the Quran is not really far from us. We understand it. But when someone from outside come, because sometimes we, uh, these kind of questions, just we take it as granted. But when someone come to your conversation and they have sort of have raised a number of questions, you feel like, well, I never thought about it. Although the Quran itself as a, you know, a book of Islam is, we have read it many times, but the, 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 the time those people are coming or those different traditions are coming to the Quran, you start to feel like the whole conversation is actually taking a different shift because there is a quite different question or has been raised. For someone who's outsider to raise a certain question about what does this mean or the, what does that mean? So you start to feel, well, I never thought about it before. Although I am I'm quite familiar with the, my structure, but I never thought about it. So we got this kind of idea because some of our students, they felt, well, I'm a Muslim. I'm actually was educated in religious studies, but I can't answer it because it's quite new question to me. So what we have done is basically we also um, extended this conversation into a WhatsApp group. Um, once students are done with the SR session, because still it's limited, they can still freely go to this WhatsApp and continue to have this kind of like discussion. And uh, to be honest with you, we found this kind of conversation is even more interesting than the session we already done because it's more of like extending the conversation in a way that students can read more and come back and start to answering some of those questions that haven't been addressed within the session due to the like the time limitation and so forth. So I, I hope uh, I answer your question. Maybe yeah, we're just gonna use this. Yes, I realize it. Just one second, please. There's a question for Isra online regarding, um, and then we come to you, and I think then we can conclude the session. There is um, a question regarding some of the text or the content of what you did in the Islamic uh, education uh, course with women. What are some of the learnings or some of the lessons that were common and what? how did you approach them? Um, okay, uh, he, he, or he or she opinion about the, the, the courses yes. itself. Yes, okay. the courses. Okay, um, uh, the courses is uh, by the institution myself. I I have registered uh, of uh, one of these courses. Uh, it was online. Uh, actually, they they give uh, offline courses also, but uh, they provide online courses for those who are not in Egypt, uh, outside Egypt. And at this time, I was in Egypt, so I I joined the uh, online course. And I found the uh, students uh, from different parts of uh, uh, Arab countries, even from Morocco. Uh, and um, uh, the age also was different, not only young, uh, there was also uh, uh, um, older people are uh, trying to learn about uh, uh, this course. Um, uh the course uh, was about um uh how to to understand uh, quran not only to to read or as uh, she mentioned in us how we only uh, memorize we focus on memorizing we focus on the contents to memorize it but later on we found ourselves not understanding all what we we are memorizing so uh, the, the course was basically focusing on how to do like tadabbur or uh, to understand Quran and also Hadith. So there were, uh, there were uh, a lot of levels. Um, uh, they are focusing uh, uh, in the beginning in uh, uh, understanding Quran, then they go through Hadith. And also there is exams, uh, online exams. They have also an online platform you can access and do the exam while the while the course is the uh, or the station is online. The uh, the exam is in the beginning of the in the beginning of the session. Um, and that's all about the course. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we will take uh, the last question. Can someone help us? 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm Dr. Abdullah Mahmoud from Bangladesh. Uh, at first, I would like to thank Alex Berger and Fazila for beautiful presentation and Issa Ahmed for her beautiful presentation. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi kalamihi al-majid. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna ja'alnaakum shu'uban wa kabaila li ta'arafu. Inna akramakum anda Allahi atqaakum. Salaq Allah al-Azim. Uh, we, we all people from a man and woman, Adam and Hawa. And how... Please ask a question. And please. Thank you. And I ask uh, how to, uh, in the world, uh, peaceful coexistence with Muslim and Christian and others religion. It can be possible by uh, online platform, by teaching language and any other ways? This is my question. So how? How do you how do, how do you do teaching? Please, yeah, thank you. How can peaceful coexistence in the world yes. with Muslim and any other religion, Christian and others? And is this possible on online platform to teach English language or others languages and Common, common interfaith dialogue with Muslims and other people. Thank you. It can be possible. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, it's actually possible, but also you have to make sure uh, people who are, those people who are coming from a certain background, they are familiar with the Islamic literature as well. Because part of the tricky thing about interfaith is some people are not aware what the Quran itself uh, uh, talks about the uh, non-Muslims like Christian and Jews or whatever um, so when they come they have this kind of like you know tendency to just not really um, understanding uh, Islamic teaching of like how to uh, dialogue with people so uh, what we have done is basically we already have worked with students who are familiar with those kind of things because they're coming from religious studies department so we, we assume that they already have this kind of a basic stuff and once we have uh, they have so so then we just take it further to do this kind of like um trying to teach them or maybe not trying to help them dialogue with someone from their outside tradition but also i have to say um because we have done this uh, in two different rounds the first one um we of course encounter certain challenges and part of it was basically um um you know having this kind of like shared terminologies like prophet, scripture, you know, like God. And of course, it means different things in different traditions. So for students to come, to come with this kind of perspective, then for the second round, we had to make introductory session in which me and Joe, we tried to give kind of like history, a bit of history, of like the history of the Quran, the history of like Bible. So students who are come and see these kind of like shared traditions, they wouldn't assume it's actually very familiar to them. No, they are, it's not familiar because uh, prophecy in Christianity is completely different from prophecy in Islam. And, th and that's really was very tricky for us. So I would say, yeah, it's actually feasible, but also you have to make sure the students who are coming, they have this kind of like, um, you know, solid background in Islamic studies. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. We're going to have to um, take a break now, a lunch break. I want to thank our in-person presenters, Isra and Ra. I also want to thank our online presenters. I know it's very early for you. At least I know Fadila you're in the US, so it's a very... No, I'm in Algeria, so I came to Algeria <laughs> last week. Yeah. Alex, yeah. Alexa. You know, Alexa. Speaking from oh, okay. And yeah. then we have uh, also your co-presenter who was with us, Fadila. So I want to thank you all for being with us so early. Thank you for being with us in person. And thank you for our uh, audience here. We will take a break, a uh, lunch break. Uh, there are, of course, the students, you know where to eat. For others, uh, we have lots of different restaurants. You can ask Sukaina or Lina for some recommendations. We will break from one right now through 220, and we'll be back here for our second panel on Scholarship and engagement of women uh, at 220 to 3:30. So please be here on time. We will start chart at 220. And for our audience online, 
that will be 2.20 local time in one hour and 20 minutes. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy your lunch.